begin with number 436, all three verses, 436. <clears throat> Would you open us in prayer, please? You can go ahead and be seated. Let's continue with number four thirty eight. First and last four thirty eight. I saw the giant prayerlessness upon the mountain high. He laughed so hard at my unbended knee. No longer in the wilderness I'll stay, and so I cry. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Grapes of Israel grow, I want that mountain, I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. Let every giant of distress and unbelief and sin get ready now to vacate for you see. I've come from out the wilderness, I know I'm going to win. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain, where the 
Wednesday night, and uh, appreciate you being here tonight. Let me go ahead and go through some announcements here quickly. And uh, if somebody could remind me, I have something I want to say off of camera after the service tonight. And so if somebody will remind me to have Matt shut that off and uh, just a, a brief reminder I want to share with everybody. Uh, let's see what else we got going on. Don't forget about the bridal shower sign-up sheet back there, the wedding sign-up sheet back there uh, for Brother Gage and Miss Leah. And then the May and June Baptist breads are back there, the devotionals back there free for the taking. Uh, please make yourself available uh, for those. Don't forget this coming Sunday night, uh, I want to meet with the uh, parents from the uh, teen group right after the evening service and uh, talk about some things there and get some feedback from you. Uh, bridal shower there's coming up, I'll be preaching. Uh, matter of fact, I don't have that on here, but next Wednesday, Brother Jeff will be running the service and preaching. Uh, I will be making a short trip up to Michigan uh, I will leave uh, Wednesday morning and we'll be back on Saturday. Uh, and so Brother Jeff will be filling in for me here next week. Do me a favor, please make sure you're here, be an encouragement to him. And uh, that would be a great, great blessing. Jeff always does a good job and I appreciate it. Um, that uh, Bible handout conference that I'm preaching over in Wildwood, Missouri is coming up. That's on Thursday and Friday, May 2nd and 3rd. If you'd please be praying for that for me, I would greatly appreciate that. That would be a great uh, uh, blessing. Missionary of the Week this week is uh, Michael Staley, our uh, missionary to the U.S. military in Spain, Rota, Spain. And uh, so pray for uh, he and I'm trying to think of his wife's name. I won't say. I'm pretty sure it's Deanne. Uh, but uh, pray, uh, pray for the Staleys over there. And then um, Jim Caffrey is home. They did something different. They didn't take the knee out and put the spacer in. Um, the doctor was afraid with Jim's fragile health as it is that he wouldn't be able to uh, handle the whole knee surgery thing again. Uh, and so what they did was pulled all of the hardware out of his knee and scrubbed it with, I don't know, betadine, whatever one of those Anyway, scrubbed it with something that's supposed to clean it, right? Uh, disinfect it, whatever else. Put it back in. Uh, loaded him up with antibiotics, obviously, and things of that nature. But uh, he's home now, and so we need to pray that what they did will fix the infection in the knee, okay? Um, obviously, keep praying for Tommy and Bob. Uh, with Gary Dice and his heart transplant recovery. I really don't know any more than I did last time there. Keep praying uh, Dick Gleason, they were at the hospital just, uh, they're probably still there now if I had to guess. Uh, hospital just, uh, they're probably still there now if I had to guess. Uh, he just having some, some issues today uh, with his legs, increased issue with his legs and swelling, uh, but also just very lethargic. So I'm not sure what is going on there, but the doctor said he probably should go to the hospital, so they did. Uh, so pray for everything to be okay there. Carolyn, with her arms and shoulders, uh, pray for my uh, daughter and the family there with sickness. Um, my uh, pastor, Pastor Robert Evans, a man that I worked for when I first came into the ministry, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease along with a plethora of other things he's dealing with. If you'd pray for him and Miss Nancy, his wife, I greatly appreciate that. And then reading the missionary letter uh, yesterday from our missionary to England, Donovan Bangs. Um, I forget what it is. Uh, he has a some type of disease, uh, something bar. It's not the Epstein bar, not that one, but it's something else, bar, B-A-R-R-E. Um, but anyway, pray for his health. And then um, his 15-year-old son, Max, had a lump on his neck. They had it checked out. Turns out he has cancer in, um, what are those things called again? Lymph nodes. Thank you. 
um, in the lymph node, 15 year old son of our missionary Donovan Bangs. So please pray for Brother Bangs and then also for his son Max. Uh, Max is dealing with cancer there, and so they greatly appreciate your prayers. Uh, prayer requests that you may have. It's good to see Debbie home. Good to see Debbie home. We prayed her home, amen. And so our prayer, that's an answer to prayer right there, praise the Lord. And um, uh, that would have been a blessing too, huh? You could have just sat back and slept the whole way. Yep, amen. Yes, ma'am. Pray for little Callie. She uh, has a problem with one of her eyes. Um with the nerves or something. She doesn't see very well out of that eye. She's going to see a neurologist on May 3rd. And so pray that they'll be able to get something figured out there and take care of that problem so Kelly can see clearly out of both them eyes. Is that right? Is that? Yeah. Where? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Three unspoken. All right. From Miss Danielle. Right. Yes, ma'am. I talked to her mom. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she's walking better, but um, still kind of a little heavy for that leg. That drop foot. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she's able to walk around without the walker for the most part. Um, her brother let her get a golf cart trial for three months to see if she could drive herself up town to get her meds and stuff. So she had it two weeks, but so far it's good. So okay. That gives her a little bit more independence. Yep. Keep praying for Lavana and uh, her health there, but that's a that's a good report there, and we'll just keep praying for her that way. That was a blessing. I was hoping maybe <clears throat> the neighbor brought her to church that one day, and that was everybody was so thrilled to see her. Yeah. The last time I talked to her, she was talking about that, but that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just keep praying for Lavana. Pray for her regularly. Send her notes, send her text messages. She may not respond, that's okay. She gets them. And uh, just uh, let her know you're praying for her. Yep, that'd be a blessing. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a few minutes and pray for some of these things. Uh, you can pray at your seat or at the altar, whatever you prefer to do, but let's take a few minutes and pray for these.
Father, we pray for these requests that have been mentioned together. Uh, we lift our hearts together to you in unison about them. And Lord, sure pray that you'd care and tend to the spoken and the unspoken tonight. I pray that you'd intercede there in the health request tonight. And Father, I pray that uh, through whatever situations and circumstances you might help us to stay focused on the Lord help us tonight now bless the young people downstairs the teenagers upstairs pray that you bless the service in here this evening bless every aspect of it father help us with it and we'll thank you in Jesus name amen fellas you go ahead and come on and we'll ready to receive the offering here tonight the Wednesday night offering Jay, won't you pray for us tonight, please? Yes, sir. Yes, God, thank you. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Please stand together once again as we sing number 202, first and last 202. to the book of Ruth again tonight. I think these are what we're looking at tonight is the 16th, 17th, and 18th principles so far in this series of lessons, principles in Ruth. Ruth chapter number one, we'll read a few verses there in just a minute. We covered three principles last week. Um, let me get this other one on, Matt. I don't think I'm going to be roaming anywhere tonight, but you never know. You never know. Give that a whirl. So last week we talked about three principles. We mentioned that God's blessings always come to those who are faithful to wait on God. Uh, it's one of the most difficult things that you and I uh, face in the Christian life is being patient and waiting on God and His timing. Uh, His timing is always right. It's always on time. It's never early. It's never late. It's always perfect. But that's not our timing most times. 
And, uh, but we talked about that. God's blessings always come to those who are faithful to wait on Him. No believer should ever be guilty of hindering others from coming to Jesus. And we talked about the importance of testimony there. And then the farther you move from God, the more hope fades and fear takes over. Uh, we could have used Naomi as an example for that here, but we looked at Orpah, uh, the daughter-in-law, the one daughter-in-law last week dealing with that. Uh, those are the three principles we covered last week. This week, I want to look at verses 8 through 10 and then 14 through 18. So let's start reading in verse 8 through 10, chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, and then we'll drop down to verse number 14 through 18. <clears throat> And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Look at verse 14. <coughs> and they lift up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, uh, then she left speaking Unto her. Father, thank you for the verses we just read, the example, the pictures uh, in uh, all three, really, Naomi, Ruth, uh, and Orpah tonight. God, I pray that you'd help us to uh, gain some, uh, some wisdom, some discernment, some insight this evening from these principles. Uh, Father, I do pray that you'd empty me of myself and fill me with yourself. God, I sure need you. And so, Lord, we ask that. We ask that you'd bind Satan and the demons of hell from this building, this place. Cast them out. And, Father, fill this place with your Holy Ghost uh, presence and power, not only in the auditorium, but even downstairs with the children and upstairs with the teenagers. Father, please bless tonight like only you can. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We mentioned last week in the final point, speaking about Orpah, uh, the, uh, the fact that she was a picture of a uh, professor and not a possessor. Uh, she professed one thing, but she did not possess that which she professed that she did. Uh, and uh, obviously using that as an illustration or a picture of someone who professes to be saved uh, but has never been genuinely born again. There's no Holy Spirit living within. And so we're going to start with that same principle and thought this morning, for the, or this evening, for the first principle here. And that is principle number one tonight, make sure you are a possessor and not just a professor. Uh, again, Orpah. Uh, in her situation, in this situation here, uh, was in this scenario, and um, to get a look at, uh, well, think about it this way. The situation that Orpah was in, coming from Moab, marrying um, one of Naomi's uh, sons, she got a look into the Jews' religion, uh, she got a look into some of that by marrying into the family that she did. She got not only a look into the Jews' religion, but also uh, the true God of heaven. Uh, she walked with them for a period of time. She talked with them. She married into the family, as I said. She began, uh, no doubt, to 
talk the talk as they did and maybe even walked the walk some as maybe they did even though they were away from God. But she had never put her faith in the true God of heaven. This is pictured in verse 14 and 15 when Orpah went back to her heathen family, went back to her heathen gods, uh, rather than staying uh, and going back to Bethlehem, Judah, uh, with Naomi. Uh, John said uh, in the, uh, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John, they went out from us because they were not of us. And uh, I believe we have a good picture of that same thing in Orpah. She was a professor, but not a possessor. Ruth, on the other hand, is the exact opposite of that. Ruth pictures that lost sinner who had been exposed to the one true God of heaven, looks into the things of God, and then believes by faith in and on him. She becomes a true possessor and not just a professor. She became a true possessor of God's eternal salvation. She decides to stay by faith, as we just read those verses there in verse 16 and in verse number 17. She chooses to stay by faith with Naomi, although Naomi, think about this, uh, the, Ruth wasn't staying with Naomi because Naomi had a lot to offer her. At this point, Naomi had lost everything. She had lost everything she had, including her husband and her, and her two sons. And so Naomi didn't have a whole lot at this part, at this point in her life, to offer Ruth, and yet Ruth decided that she was going to, by faith, stay with Naomi and go back to the land of the Lord, if you will, in Bethlehem, Judah. I would draw a conclusion, church, tonight that the Lord was at work in Ruth's heart through all of this. Ruth, in this picture, this, this whole story, this whole passage, this whole account of what took place that we've looked at, it's a two-edged sword. And what I mean by that is there are positives and negatives. We have focused primarily on the negatives thus far, okay? Um, and the application of those is true. Uh, they're absolutely there. But Ruth is proof that God can and God will use anything he chooses to bring somebody to himself. And not only that, to bring good out of a bad situation. Uh, listen, I'm forever grateful that the boneheaded decisions that I have made in my life, God can still bring good out of some of those things. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for a God that is not uh, handcuffed and tied by uh, wrong decisions. Now, but that's one side of the two-edged sword. God can still do good things, but the other side of that two-edged sword is still there. And that's the consequences for the decision, right? And so, uh, listen, uh, it, it, was, it was a blessing. There was no stellar witness that Ruth had and no stellar testimony that Ruth got to witness in Naomi, if you will. And yet, Ruth, there was enough of something there that God began working in Ruth's heart and Ruth chose God. How important was this decision by Ruth to trust God? I submit to you, based on knowing the history now, because we have the completed Word of God, that decision by Ruth to trust God was very important. It determined that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. That decision did. Obviously, she went back, she met Boaz, all of that takes place. She becomes the grandmother of King David, the lineage, it's all there. Okay? And so that decision to trust God by that Moabitess woman, Ruth, was very important. 
God used this situation for good. God used this situation as part of his will or to accomplish his will. Uh, can God, uh, uh, God can, and yes, we know the answer to that, but God can turn a poor choice into a positive. And as I said, I'm extremely thankful for that. But that is only one side of the two-edged sword there. There are still, let's not forget, God made good come out of this, but Naomi still had to live day in and day out, day in and day out with the consequences of the decision to go to Moab and to leave Bethlehem, Judah. She was still husbandless, right? She was still childless, if you will. Her life and appearance, according to the comments when she returned back to Bethlehem, uh, uh, her appearance was marred and, and forever changed, if you will. And um, uh, the fact of the matter is there's a two-edged sword in that, but I'm glad in my boneheaded decisions in my own life that God can be merciful and still bring good out of some of those things just like he did here. That encourages me. Because let's be honest, there's nobody under the sound of my voice, including this guy right here, that nails every decision in life. Nobody. God knows what we're made of. He knows our frailties. He knows all of that, and I'm thankful for his mercy and bringing out some positives, even uh, in some poor choices that I make, uh, have made in my life. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that. Make sure, make sure you're a Ruth and not an Orpah. Make sure you're a possessor and not a professor. In other words, make sure you're saved. Amen? Uh, that's principle number one. Now, principle number two tonight, God always honors the faith of someone seeking him. God always honors the faith of one seeking him. I'll go as far as to say this. Let me broaden that even a little more. God rewards all levels of faith. It's faith that he requires of us in everything. Faith begins the Christian life, right? We're saved by faith. We grow by faith. As we read things in the Word of God, we hear things preached from the Word of God, we receive them, accept them, begin to apply. You know what we're doing? That's faith, right? And so we're to, we learn to trust Him. We learn to give and we learn to uh, uh, be sensitive to the Spirit of God and do that which He prompts and leads and all of these things. But whether it's a minute amount of faith or whether it is so great faith, God is bound by his word and he honors faith of any level. God honors that. Um, Ruth made a total commitment here though, didn't she? I want you to look, there's a beautiful picture of salvation. I know we used Orpah for the opposite here, but I want to look at this here, <clears throat> dealing with the faith that she placed in God here. Uh, Ruth makes a total commitment of faith that extends based on her words in verse 16 and 17 all the way to death. That's what she said. She made a decision, a total commitment of faith that extended all the way to death. And for her, there would be no looking back from that. She made a total commitment of faith and said, I'm not turning back on that. That is a decision until I die. And so, uh, certainly, uh, we read those verses in verse number 17. Uh, there she said, where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and moreover, if aught but death part me, thee from me. She said, I'm following you, Naomi, wherever you go, that's where I'm going. And uh, until death, that's what, what I'm going to do. And uh, she made a total commitment of faith that extended all the way till death. Now, think about this with me in picturing salvation in her decision there, not only in trusting God, but following Naomi. Think about these three things that picture salvation. The decision that she made here gave her new life. Look at verse number 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave me or to return from following after thee, 
For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. She was leaving a cursed land for a blessed land. She was leaving her false gods for the one true God of heaven. Amen. And so there's the decision that she made gave her new life, a new life indeed. Not only that, this decision brought a new Lord. Amen. Verse 16, the Bible said there, we just read it, thy God shall be my God. Naomi, your God, the God of the Jews, will now become my God. Uh, the gods that I served in uh, my heathen land of Moab, mm -mm, not following them anymore. Naomi, your God, the God of the Jews, the true God of heaven will be my God. Amen. Amen. And so the decision gave her new life. But not only that, the decision uh, uh, brought her a new Lord. She was leaving those old false gods for the one true God in heaven. Thirdly, about this decision of faith in her life, the decision brought a new loyalty. A new loyalty. We read it just a minute ago, but again in verse number 17, Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part me and thee. In other words, she made a decision that was a decision for the rest of her life. And that's what salvation is, amen? When you get born again, uh, I understand dedication, rededication, all that stuff, but as a picture of the whole of salvation, when you get born again, you get what kind of life? You get new life just like I got new life when you got born again. She got new life, right? There's that picture of new life, eternal life there uh, here on earth that way for sure. Uh, and then a new Lord, the gods that I used to serve, my belly, myself, amen, whatever. I got a new God when I got born again, amen, and I had a new Lord. Uh, there was a new loyalty. Uh, uh, she was said, to, I am following you and the Jews and the, the God of the Jews and the religion of the God of the Jews. I'm following you until death. There was a loyalty there in her decision of faith. And she made that decision for the rest of her life. And fact of the matter is, that should be the same thing when we trust Christ as our Savior, uh, that we uh, turn from uh, uh, the direction we're going and turn unto Him and trust Him as our Savior and start following. It doesn't mean we won't stumble down again, but that ought to be a lifelong loyalty to the God that saved us. Amen? And so we see the pictures there. Beautiful picture of salvation. When we get saved, we get new life, a new Lord, and a new loyalty until death as well. What did she have to go back to in Moab? Not a whole lot, did she? She had false gods that could never do anything for her. She had a heathen people and a heathen land. Immorality. That's all she had to go back to. But the question is... What do we have to go back to into the world after we get saved? Same things. Full of false teachings, false gods, false hopes, right? Same thing, immorality, all the above. There's nothing in this world for the child of God back in the world. There's nothing there but hopelessness, guilt, and emptiness, which... If you got saved a little later in life, you can look back on it and clearly see that that's exactly what you had before you got saved. I did. Hopelessness, emptiness, and guilt. Trying to fill it with all different things from alcohol to drugs to partying to whatever else. You're trying to fill that emptiness. That void that only God can take, amen? You try to fill it with all kinds of, but there's no, it's all vain. It's all vain. But here's a question tonight. <clears throat> Before I get to my third and final point this evening, here's a question for us. 
you have three widows here, right? You have Naomi, you have Ruth, and you have Orpah. Which one of these three, these poor widows, represents my life the best or represents your life the best? Naomi, a person who knows the Lord but needs to get back to the place of blessing. She's away spiritually. She's not where she needs to be. Backslidden, whatever word you might use on it. Maybe it's Naomi that best depicts you tonight. Only you know that in your heart. What about Orpah? Someone who has looked into God but decided not to choose him and his salvation. And so, in doing so, have chosen your sins over God. Maybe Orpah tonight is a better picture of you. Only you know that in your heart. Maybe you're a professor and not a possessor. What about Ruth, though? What about Ruth? You've made a decision by faith to follow the Lord until he takes you home. You've just made up your mind. Listen, he saved me, and I am going to be faithful to him. I'm not going to be perfect, but I am going to do my dead level best to be faithful to to him. Which one of those three? Probably each one of us is represented by one of those tonight. Naomi, Orpah, or Ruth. Principle number one tonight. Make sure you are a possessor, not just a professor. And then God always honors the weak or the faith of the one seeking him. Whether that's weak faith or so great faith, God honors faith. God always honors faith. And then number three, number three, and we can, I'm not going to carry this out and extend this out, but we could talk about this principle for a long, long time probably. It's a little bit longer, so let me read it to you. Make all of your decisions in the light of eternity because eternity is the thing that really matters. Make all of your decisions in light of eternity because eternity is what really matters. Matt, I'm going to throw something out to you. You can come to me after the service and let me know if you've ever heard this yet or not, okay? It's a Mississippi River history, Okay? Any other history buffs? If you've ever heard this, I would be curious to know uh, what I come across here, if you, if you already knew this. On November 16th, 1811, an unusual thing happened to the Mississippi River. Who said that? Who said, mm -hmm, somebody knows it? You know what happened? The name Mississippi comes from an Indian word that means big river. The river flows some 2,348 miles from its source in northwestern Minnesota all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. What happened in 1811 was unprecedented for the river. An earthquake hit the state of Missouri. That's kind of weird to me, but an earthquake hit the state of Missouri and had a strange effect on the river. For a short period of time, the river's direction was interrupted and it flowed backwards. Did anybody here know that? Some of you did. Oh, I, I just thought that was pretty cool. I learned something. See, y'all smart and everything. I just, I learned something. By way of illustration, though, there have been many that have found themselves going backwards in their Christian life for a period of time. Right? We think of Demas and Peter, even John Mark, Jonah, even David. <coughs> Surely this is the situation that Naomi finds herself in here is obviously she's gotten off track here for a bit. Surely this is 
how Naomi found herself in this situation, living in Moab with a dead husband and two dead sons. She never meant for this to happen. She didn't go there expecting these consequences. But one day she wakes up and finds that she's miles away from where the Lord wanted her to be. And so, I'm thankful, as I said earlier today, and sometimes we can go the wrong direction for a period of time, just like Naomi did. Maybe not for as long as Naomi, certainly, hopefully not. But sometimes we get away from God for a little bit. But I'm thankful for the positive part of this story that is what we're getting into now that we're through verse number 18 there. I'm thankful as I read this for the mercy of God because it's the same mercy of God that allowed Naomi to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. It's the same mercy of God that allows the prodigal to come back to the father. It's the same mercy of God that allows you and I to come back to him and get things right with him when we have been hit by a uh, earthquake and now we're flowing a different direction for a period of time, right? It's the mercy of God that allows us to get flowing back the right direction again and back on track again. And uh, thanks be to God for the, the positive part of this. This passage is all about how Naomi found her way back home to Bethlehem and to the place of blessing. Now let's notice, let's notice her return here. And I'm not going to take the time and, and, and delve into this deeply, but let's, let's read verse 19. <clears throat> so they too, that's Naomi and Ruth, went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? She'd been gone for 10 years. We've already talked about that. She just went to sojourn for a little time. But the Bible says they dwelled there in verse number 4, about 10 years. So she's been gone for about 10 years. And now this trip from Moab back to Bethlehem. She, like the prodigal, if you will, through circumstances, through the scenario, comes to herself. And now she's heading back to where, uh, to Bethlehem, uh, which is where she needs to be. The trip from Moab to Bethlehem would have taken seven to ten days to get there. And as we talked about at the beginning, it required the crossing of the Jordan River. They had to cross that. Elimelech, her and the boys had to cross that to get to Moab. It was on the uh, wilderness side of the Jordan River, Moab was. Uh, and so they had to cross back over to get back into the promised land, if you will, <clears throat> back in uh, to Bethlehem, and not only seven to ten days to get there and required the crossing of the Jordan River, but also in climbing about 2,000 plus feet of elevation and mountainous terrain to get to Bethlehem. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but the Spirit of God just pressed something on my heart. You ever realize how easy it is to get away from God? Everything I just read right there, the seven to ten days of travel, that's one day is bad enough, two days bad enough, right? Seven to ten days of travel, and they didn't have a car, right? So we're talking physically, they're traveling seven to ten days, crossing the Jordan River, climbing up 2,000 plus feet of mountainous terrain to reach this thing of Bethlehem. It was probably a whole lot easier for them to get down to Moab, at least they felt like it was. But man, when you make up your mind 
to get back to where God is. The devil's going to fuss and he's going to fight. And it's not going to be as easy as it was going to. We talk about church attendance a lot. And this, this crowd here is not who I'm preaching to. You're the, uh, this is a Wednesday night crowd. That's the cream of the cream. But the fact of the matter is, it is so easy to get out of regular attendance at church. Just miss one service. And then before you know it, that one service doesn't bother you. It bothered you the first time. And then didn't bother you so much the next time, and then less the next time. And then missing two services that you could have been at. I understand people have work schedules. That's not what I'm talking about. It's easy to get out. But it's not so easy to get back where you need to be. But if you'll make that choice, you'll make that decision, God will help you climb the mountainous terrain, the elevation. She ended up back there, didn't she? She got back where she was going. The prodigal ended up back home. They got where they were going by God's grace. But going back is always harder than leaving. Let's just, anyway. It would have been easier to stop short of the city, wouldn't it? <clears throat> but they didn't. They continued until they were back to where they were supposed to be. She had made a good decision in returning. Amen? Amen? But she had to follow through with that decision and she had to go through some things in order to get there. All of that said tonight, church, three simple principles we talked about a lot. I, I enjoy these principles because there's different things you can look at, uh, but the principles are, are important, but there's also other, um, I guess, principles or thoughts there too we, we, that we do look at. Number one, make sure you're a possessor and not just a professor. Most important thing is to be born again. Just know that you're born again. Know that you are. If you're not, you can get saved here tonight. Secondly, God always honors the faith of one that is seeking him. Small faith, large faith, God always honors it. It's faith that he honors. And number three, make all of your decisions in light of eternity because eternity is what really matters. Eternity is what really matters. Father, thank you for the time we've had together in the Word of God tonight. Thank you for your people. They're always so gracious and listening. God, uh, there are uh, probably a multitude of ways that these principles could have been applied to our lives. Lord, I pray, Holy Ghost of God, that you've done in my heart and our hearts exactly what you wanted done. Father, pray that you'd help us tonight as we dismiss you. Uh, Lord, give safety on the way home. Uh, Father, continue to bless those that um, have work weeks in front of them yet remaining. Give them grace and strength and uh, help them to work well. And uh, Lord, to be a good witness and testimony at the same time. Father, thank you for loving us. I pray that you dismiss us tonight with your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, you're dismissed. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, kill the feed, Matthew.